Brent Ibby joining us. Brent, welcome to the show, mate. Yeah, hi, Marty, and how are you going? Oh, having a great time. Absolutely loving it, mate. Now, look, after the All Blacks turned in such a great performance against Wales, here we are. We're not talking about the number one rugby side in the country. We're talking about the biggest noise, and this week is going to be our women's team, the Black Ferns, who have sold out Eden Park. Not just them, but Eden Park is a sellout for the final. Outstanding, isn't it? Oh, it is outstanding. I mean, if I think back to when um, Mark Robinson and Farah Palmer led our bid uh, for the World Cup at, at a meeting in, um, in Dublin, uh, I was over there at the time, and uh, they led the bid. And um, we were actually outbid financially, uh, but got it on the, on the promise to really supercharge the women's game. And uh, it really came down to World Rugby trusting uh, New Zealand that uh, we could do that and uh, over the past few weeks I think we have more than uh, satisfied that request. Organically grown is what we were kind of hoping and wanting and that's how this is, I mean how much you know how, I mean I, what I'm trying, I suppose the question I want is I mean that could not have been a more perfect semi-final in so many ways could it? The result was exactly right but it was the game the tension, the excitement, the crowd and everything I just think if it needed a rocket launcher that was at the Women's World Cup Oh, no doubt about that. Um, it's been building throughout. I think the way that the Black Ferns play the game um, is highly entertaining. Uh, it's fast, uh, and um, credit must go to uh, to the coaching team for, for what they have done. And um, it's not only on the field, but off the field. True. Um, these young women are becoming um, really national icons, the way they portray themselves, the, the happiness that you see from them, the way they, they exude, I guess. Um, and it, it's a pleasure. Brent, so when you bid, and let's just cark back to that. So Australia were offering more money. Was it along the lines of, and I remember with the 211 World Cup and that, that when it was staged here, we were promising a, a kind of a rugby event that no other country could do because it's our national game. Was that part of the sell for you to get that Women's World Cup rights? Essentially, that was the sell. Uh, yes, Australia's bid was financially uh, higher than ours, but... Um, we went in with a, with a plan that uh, really was to put the women's game uh, on the international stage, but also also here in New Zealand because we wanted to encourage women here and overseas to play the game and also to show the values of rugby as a sport. And if, if you take both of those things, uh, I think they've been well overachieved over the past few weeks. So, uh, yes, and um, the, the feedback that um, we've had from uh, World Rugby has, is, I mean, they're more than delighted Brilliant. with um, what's happened. And, and you mentioned in the opening the ratings. Yep. Uh, well, th those ratings for, for TV3 are absolutely sensational. Yeah, they're brilliant, aren't they? I mean, look, I'm, I was just trying to think, and, and, du and during your time as CEO of MediaWorks, Pete Brent was in charge of MediaWorks, people. That's how we kind of originally met and things, and, and that's TV3. So if you're wondering, News Hub is TV3. I'm just trying to explain that to people. I mean, that is a stunning audience. That's almost a million people. I don't know how many times or what, or what other programs would attract that kind of audience for TV3. Oh, very few. Um, if you go back in time, things um, such as you, you remember there was um, the Dean Lonergan boxing events. Yes. Um, they, they attracted huge audiences. Oh, the David um, Tua fight, the, I remember, was on three, wasn't it, against Lennox Lewis? That was a monster back in the early 2000s. Yeah, that, that was a monster. Um, uh, the, um, we had the rights to the 2007 Rugby World Cup. There were some huge right. uh, ratings in, in those days. But um, to get close on a million people uh, watching that on, on Saturday night on, on TV3 is just absolutely sensational. Brian, was it a mistake selling it to Spark? I, I said right at the beginning that I thought that had to be on free-to-wear. If this was on free-to-wear, you'd start getting these crowds. Was it a mistake or was that just a financial thing that has to happen that you've got to have a, a provider as well as a free-to-wear provider? We've got to remember that those rights are owned by World Rugby. They sold the rights, not New Zealand Rugby. Right. So it's, it's, it's that simple. And World Rugby is just going for the highest bidder, aren't they? Well, no, not necessarily. I mean, having been involved back in MediaWorks when we bid for sporting rights, um, uh, it's it's not just the highest bidder; it's what you can deliver deliver around it. Uh, Spark had the rights to the men's uh, last men's rugby world yeah. cup in in uh, Japan, and um, my recollection is that this rugby world cup was sold um, at the same time as part of a package. Um, 
clearly uh, there is a, um, a trade-off between what uh, you get from a pay TV provider, whether it's Sky and Spark, and free-to-air. Yep. Free-to-air doesn't have the, the money to be able to bid because it's relying simply on advertising as opposed to the others which are subscription-based services. So you're always dealing with a trade-off uh, as between free-to-air and um, subscription television. So Brendan is, is with us, uh, people, and Brendan's also spent a heck of a lot of his time uh, negotiating rights to things, selling TV uh, rights, all that kind of stuff. So it's an area of absolute expertise, which is part of what you brought to the rugby union when you became chairman. A lot of questions have been asked about, and hopefully you can explain this as, as well, as to why the this tournament was has been held in Whangarei, Waitakere in Auckland and wasn't nationwide like the previous Rugby World Cup, the Men's and the Football Ferns World Cup, or sorry, the FIFA Football World Cup is going to be nationwide. Was it just a COVID thing? Was it was it around that and, and the kind of the, the uh, logistics pointed that it had to be condensed into a certain area? No, it comes down to, uh, to cost, really. Um, the, uh, when it, when uh, bids were made, um, the, there's, um, you, you've got to try and get as close to break even as, as is possible. Um, remembering that the 12 teams uh, uh, cost a lot in terms of accommodation, training facilities, etc. That's why the decision was made that way. Um, Whangarei came through, or the Northland Councils came through with um, uh, an attractive proposal um, supported by um, by what Auckland did. So uh, that's really what it came down to, Marty. Um, okay. uh, the, if you go back to the last tournament as well, a, a little bit different from, from the men's. So the last tournament was which was played in in Dublin. Uh, all of the all of the matches were played at the university. Um, all of the teams stayed in the in the halls of residence there um, because it was during uh, university university break. And um, so these teams were used to living in the same accommodation and um, in the atmosphere uh, then. Uh, was just absolutely terrific, the camaraderie between the teams. And you saw it again uh, in the weekend. For yeah. example, the, the when the French uh, woman stopped to help the New Zealand player with cramp. I mean, these are examples of how the woman approached the game in a, probably in a different manner. And, um, and, and, and that comes back to, um, to, to, to it as well, is, is a tournament where everybody was together. So Auckland and Northland achieved that. And then there was the cost factor. You've wanted to make it as accessible as possible, though. I mean, do you, do you look back now and think that, you know, how... how it, well, I mean, it's only 12 teams, I suppose, and it's got to grow, doesn't it? Maybe next time we get it next time and it can extend throughout the country. But, you know, I mean, this is what the Football World Cup, the FIFA Women's World Cup is going to have that advantage of. And, and if you cast your mind back to 2011, mate, I mean, how much fun that was when you saw... Georgia run out against Russia and Palmerston North. There's not a cash flea in the phone book. And there was half of 5,000 Georgian flags thing. I mean, that's kind of where it, New Zealand really embraces it. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, but if you go back to the, to the goals, the goals were to supercharge the women's game, not only here in New Zealand, but uh, worldwide as, as well. And um, so that was, that was the goal of it. And, and I think um, that's more than, more than being achieved. Brent Tibby is with us. When I read that article this morning on News Hub and it said that 900,000 um, viewers for the free-to-air coverage, I was gobsmacked and I thought, wow, that is incredible. And then there's another para paragraph in it which said, oh, it's a much bigger audience than the All Blacks playing uh, the second Bledisloe Cup test at Eden Park. I'm curious as to where uh, whoever wrote the article got those figures from because trying to prize any figures out of Sky in terms of their TV viewing for rugby is just, it's like trying to get into Fort Knox at the moment. So do you know where they got those that, that comparison from? Uh, no, I don't. Um, uh, that information, as you say, can only be obtained via uh, Sky TV. Um, but I'll just make this comment that um, you're comparing apples and oranges. You're comparing subscription television where, where the, I think the number of homes, uh, I don't have the exact number, but it's something like 40 to 45% of homes have Sky TV versus free-to-air, which is 100%. So yeah. you're comparing apples and oranges, really. Brent, how do we capitalise, when I say we, I mean obviously the rugby union, I mean the sport in this country, anyone who is interested and supports it, how do we capitalise after this World Cup finishes? Because there is a real euphoria aspect to this. This team, our team's in the final now. It's a historic event. I know that those tickets are gold dust. We had Nick Sortner on. You can't get a ticket for love nor money going to Eden Park. But it's 
it's afterwards when it comes back down again. You've got next year, you've got the Women's MPC, you got, sorry, the Farah Palmer Cup, you've got the Super Rugby O-Picky. How, how do you maintain this wave? That's going to take some real inventiveness and brains and plans, isn't it? I agree. If you look at it from, I'll give you a couple of examples of that, Marty. Yeah. If you take football, um, uh, look at the 1982 World Cup. Now, I was fortunate enough uh, at that time to be um, on air like, like you are. Yeah. I was a sports broadcaster, and I managed to persuade the then Radio Pacific that I could um, call football matches. So <laughs> they sent me to... <laughs> yeah, I, know, I, know, I, know, I know, ridiculous as it may seem. Brilliant. But anyway, I went to Spain um, for, the, for them and for the private radio um, stations at the time, and... The whole talk there was, could New Zealand football capitalise on having got for the first time to the World Cup finals in Spain? Yeah. And we're fortunate enough that we scored a couple of goals in the first game uh, against Scotland, Scotland and yep. then um, and we played we played Russia and then we played Brazil. Brazil that's right. New Zealand rug, New Zealand football failed miserably to capitalise on the fact that um, the 1982 World Cup was a launch pad for the game uh, in New Zealand. And quite a lot has been written about that failure to capitalise. Compare it to rugby, and at the same time, 1981 was the Springbok uh, Spring tour. tour. Yeah. And New Zealanders, for a, for a period, fell out with, um, with rugby. Yeah, it, we did. It, it was... It was it was not not good and not looking good for the future of the sport. And then along came the 1987 Rugby World Cup, and I remember going to the opening game with my dad, and we played Italy, and there was not a big crowd at Eden Park. No, it was a weekday, um, wasn't it, Brenda? It was in the afternoon during the week, right. wasn't it? That, yeah. That's right. John Kerwin scores that's an 80 right. metre yeah. try, and all of a sudden. Uh, back came New Zealanders and their love of rugby. We win the World Cup and on a roll, and it has never stopped. Right. In this, and the reason I say this is if you look at um, this World Cup, uh, this is the launch pad for the women's, the women's game. Uh, I'm not involved anymore with New Zealand rugby. I finished in April, so I don't yeah. know what their plans are, but I do know that uh, Mark Robinson and his team are absolutely committed to using this World Cup to capitalise on um, on the um, euphoria, the atmosphere, um, uh, the whole presence of it to encourage uh, young women to uh, play the game and to get the game set up both from a playing point of view and from a commercial point of view. So I think you'll see a lot in the space uh, what I don't know because I'm no longer sure. involved. A couple of things before we let you go, and I thank you so much for your time, mate. I could have talked to you for an hour, God, easily. Look, um, there's just there's something that, just joyous about watching this team. And look, for the opening um, matches at Eden Park, I didn't go along to that, but I live in Kingston, and so I'm such a train spotter. I spent my time, I wandered around in the afternoon and night. I was just really interested in who was in the pubs, who was in the cafes, who was walking the streets. A completely different crowd, and I spoke to Nick Sautner about this, a completely different crowd than would go to a, an all-black test match. N not as much male, not as much beer drinking, certainly not as much moaning and misery. Most people who go to those matches, you know, end up walking out going, oh, the All Blacks bloody didn't do that, didn't do that. It was just a much more of a party kind of atmosphere. And I was wondering whether you're getting that same feeling for a start from this, that there's a different kind of crowd that has gone to those games. And I don't know, just a lot more, can I say fun? Is that the right word? Yeah, well, I've been to um, both the opening match uh, and also last um, last Saturday afternoon evening, uh, and the the crowd is certainly a buzz. I mean, the the atmosphere on Saturday was electrifying, um, but I do think uh, around the the men, men, uh, rugby men are talking women's rugby at the moment. For Good example, I, I'm. Um, live on Waiheke Island and uh, on a, a, there's a group of us who go for a walk on Sunday mornings. Well, all we talked about last Sunday was the women's rugby. Brilliant. And I think men are now um, have really realised not just... Um, it's been an eye-opener for them uh, that uh, how good um, a game it is. And it's, it's highly entertaining, very fast, and the skill levels are, are terrific. So I think, yes, um, uh, we are seeing... Um, uh, mums taking taking their kids, uh, a lot of young girls going to, going to the game, and hopefully that's going to explode into them playing the game. But also, I think it's been um, an eye opener uh, in, a, in a very positive way for for men.
Yeah, I agree. I totally agree with you, mate. And there's something about pin your ears back, go for the corner that I love about watching it. Um, also, this the as you mentioned earlier, um, just you know, this is a bunch of women who've got great stories. They're so you know, they're so unmediated and that they haven't been suffocated by a thousand interviews. That they actually are very real at what they say. They you know love their fans. They talk afterwards and that, and you just get I don't know. Just there's something joyous about it, and I hope it continues not only this weekend, but well into it. How was your heart, mate, when she was lining up that penalty 35 metres out with a couple of seconds? <laughs> oh, good, yeah, there you go. I mean, I was just thinking France are going to do it to us again. I don't know what you were thinking. Yeah. Well, I was thinking that, and then I was thinking, um, I reminded, uh, just a flash went through my head at the time, is I remember the, the third Lions test where um, uh, the, the penalty was kicked over. And oh, then that's right. And then Karen Reed had to to go from the kickoff and jump up and tap it back, so we got the ball, and then should have, of course had that penalty. But so I was thinking, oh, are we in for for this sort of uh, situation? Um, and I've got to admit, I uh, yelled for joy when uh, that poor French girl missed the kick. Yeah, should have done, but yeah. I did. Yeah. Lovely talking to you, mate. It's been it's been fabulous, as you say. And nine hundred thousand people. I mean, those figures can't be wrong. That's the thing. I mean, that said to me everything when I saw that today. I said, "In New Zealand, you've got it. You're finally on with it." Thank you, Brent. Appreciate your time, mate. Cheers, Marty. Bye. All right, that's Brent Impey with us, ladies and gentlemen, the former chair of NZR and also the former CEO of MediaWorks, MediaWorks TV Three which is now Discovery, I think. Oh, I can't keep up anyway, but they've got the free-to-air rights and an outstanding audience figure of 900,000 watching that game on the weekend. That's the, that's the Black Ferns game, and that's going to go well over a million. I'd say a top one and a half, which when you think about it, for any single event in this country, I mean, there's probably more people poor than what's the election coverage. Or Shortland Street. Oh, my God. Do you know I've never watched an episode? I've never watched an episode. I've never watched a Game of Thrones. Can I be the only person in the no, world no, that stands that. up and just says, I don't care about I, I've never watched sorty, one sorty, dragony, dragony, here comes the darkness, prepare for what? Just grow up. Grow up and treat me like an adult. Dragons are not real. They're like the Redskins winning the NFL. It's never happening.